It's been quite a while since I've made a Gaming is Dying video, and something that I've been thinking about more and more over the past year is the death of escapism. Now, as you could probably guess from the thumbnail, this is going to be a somewhat political video, so if that bothers you, now's the time to leave. A big part of the appeal of video games for me and many other people is escaping reality for one reason or another. And as society has made the slow march into making literally everything political, with many people simply telling you that everything is political, yet out of the other side of their mouth also telling me that I'm making things political when everything's political, so figure that one out. If they didn't have double standards, they'd have no standards at all, right? So as escapism slowly dies, so does my joy for video games. Though obviously there's many, many reasons why I've slowly become apathetic over time. But let's just try to focus on escapism this episode. But before I get into this any further, let's get to this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Exter. Are you sick of awkwardly fumbling through your wallet every time you go to checkout? Exter has a solution for you. Their wallets have a signature trigger mechanism that gives you convenient access to your cards at the press of a button. Exter has both a small, modern form factor card holders made of aluminum or carbon fiber and wallets wrapped in premium leather for those who prefer a classic, more distinguished style. The wallets also feature built-in RFID blocking to protect you from data theft. If you're prone to losing your wallet or phone like I am, Exter also offers a solar-powered tracking device that features a two-way ringing feature, meaning you can find your phone or wallet as long as you have one or the other. You can get up to 35% off Exter wallets this Valentine's Day sale when you use my link shop.exter.com slash synthetic man or my discount code synthetic. Thank you Exter for supporting the channel, now back to the video. So as for escapism, there's obviously a lot of different elements that goes into this, immersion being a big factor. And obviously this entire subject is highly subjective. What bothers me probably doesn't bother most people, which is evident by the countless backlash I've received for complaining about literally anything in video games. Because if you're told something's a masterpiece, it absolutely is, no question. And I do want to address that this is not specifically going to be a Dead Space remake evaluation type of thing. I talked about it for about five minutes in my Last of Us Episode 3 review, and I will be retreading a couple of those points for this video, but it's not specifically about that game. There's definitely much more woke games than Dead Space Remake, but it was still bad enough to catch my attention, that's for sure. So let's get to the first point of contention and the one that inspired this video. Modern politics. It's basically impossible to escape progressive ideology in any modern AAA game and in a lot of indie games as well. Worse yet, a lot of leftists and grifters pretending to be centrist or right-leaning attempt to gaslight us by debating what the term woke even means. To me, woke represents any political messaging, subliminal or not, that pushes these modern progressive ideals. This covers a pretty vast spectrum, which is why there's been so much pushback from these so-called centrists. And look, my personal definition is broad on purpose, because sometimes subliminal messaging is even more important than the stuff vomited in your face. The thing is, we have now become so used to these devs pushing harder and harder, that now when some of the more anticipated games have dialed it back a step or two, people are now pretending it doesn't count as woke anymore, right? I've talked about the Overton window shifting a bunch of times. I'm getting tired of using that term, but the point is, we have become so used to the absurd, nearly parody tier leftist crap like Velma or The Last of Us Part Two that when something like God of War Ragnarok or the Dead Space remake shows up, people are debating whether or not it's woke at all even when those very same changes were done to something like Rings of Power, right? Like race-swapping characters or making some of the female characters absurdly powerful, even better than men. If it counts as woke for TV, why is it not woke for video games? Well, that's a subject for a different video. The point is, when I see this stuff, especially when it's a remake, and it obviously wasn't in the original, then obviously that's gonna bother me because it was a change made on purpose by developers 
to push subliminal messaging, like the all-gender bathroom in Dead Space Remake. Unisex and all gender are not the same fucking thing, especially when they use the pedestrian icon that obviously represents trans people being like half male, half female, or whatever. If it just said unisex, I honestly would not have given a fuck. And then there seems to be a different problem, and I don't know if this was due to YouTube policy changes around what is considered racism, but I've noticed more and more that a lot of people are completely fine with race swapping under certain contexts. I don't really have enough data here to give you an answer as to why this is, but again, something that was complained about with Rings of Power is now completely fine with God of War Ragnarok, despite the fact that they're both based on white culture. And I am in no interest to debate what white means or what culture means. The fact that anyone's even trying to debate those terms proves they're using the exact same tactics that the left does. And look, I'm not going to turn this into a fucking drama video, so I will end it there. But just keep an eye out for these anti-SJW types in the near future. Because I feel like the tide is shifting once again on YouTube. Where in a year or two, you might not even be allowed to talk about this shit anymore. My channel will probably be shadow banned. But for the moment, I would just advise paying very close attention to the consistency of the creators that you enjoy watching. The consistency of their views, specifically. This is not in any way me trying to start some kind of purity spiral to slowly radicalize people over time. I'm completely fine with my viewers having different views than me. It happens all the time. My like-dislike ratios are far below average for any media content reviewer. No, what I'm doing is essentially gatekeeping, which of course has a very negative connotation amongst certain groups on the internet but I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The entire point of gatekeeping is just to ensure that the people in your hobby are the people who actually care about said hobby, the people who are invested in it and have a deep emotional attachment. Not the type of people who are just there to grift or to slowly turn the hobby into what they want instead of just enjoying it for what it is, which has destroyed many, many subcultures over time that certain people have subverted fan bases or even movements and destroyed them from within. Now since I've already derailed the entire purpose of this video, let's try and get back to examples of games where they just shoved politics where it didn't belong. Now the most obvious recent example of this was Forspoken, which I feel like the only reason it was even made is to pad out Square Enix's ESG score. If they hadn't gotten funding from BlackRock, there's no way this would have ever seen the light of day. It's obvious that they had no idea what they actually wanted to make as a game. So seeing as the likely lengthy pre-production hadn't produced anything worthy of making a game, that's where ESG comes along and is like, okay, you need to have a black female protagonist on top of a culturally diverse fantasy world with no explanation as to how those people got there or how a librarian can be morbidly obese. And of course, everyone has to be ugly as well. That goes without saying. So we can give you millions of dollars to make this inevitable flop. And so we're given Frey, who is an incredibly sanitized 20-year-old orphan who, if you haven't played the game and only heard clips of her dialogue, you would think, well, she's not a stereotype, at the very least, except for the fact that she's committed three felonies, has spent a considerable amount of money on sneakers despite living in a shithole, she works for a gang, and honestly, the list goes on. I covered it in my review if you're curious. So it's funny that her dialogue is written more like some kind of quirky Marvel movie mixed with a millennial white woman trying to write what Zoomers are like these days, and it just doesn't work in the least. And so to bring this back around to the escapism point, a big problem with this is that isekai stories are almost anti-escapism, at least for me. Conceptually, it should be the opposite, because it's a normal person being brought into some magical world and you get superpowers. And so, on the surface level, you think, oh shit, that might actually be the perfect escapist story, because it's made for normies to pretend that they live in a fantasy world and have superpowers. Now here's the problem with that. One, you need to have a blank slate protagonist to make this even feasible. Or at least a protagonist that serves as a male or female power fantasy. So that even though we couldn't picture ourselves literally being this person, 
at least we can look to them as a sort of idealized version of ourselves, which is how heroes used to be written. Now so many hero characters are horribly flawed, and sometimes those flaws aren't even intentional. To make those characters feel more relatable, where in reality, it feels like the opposite for somebody like me, because I don't want to be this super flawed person. I don't want to be a Mary Sue or a Gary Stu either, but that certainly would be a step up from being completely unlikable, like Frey is. Another example of a game that kind of ruined my escapism is Far Cry 6. The Far Cry games are actually pretty okay as escapist fantasies because the characters are pretty much blank slates with the exception of Jason Brody, and even in his case, he didn't really talk that much, especially not during gameplay, so it's still pretty easy to insert ourselves in his shoes, and there's a sort of Ludo Kino aspect to it, to use kind of a cringy term, but I think it works in this case where Jason is slowly desensitized to all the horrific violence over the course of the game, much the same as a gamer would be over the course of the game. You slowly get used to doing all this crazy shit, and it becomes normal for you. And that was actually pretty well handled, despite the fact that the story was more on the minimalist side of things, as it should be for a lot of video games. But as for Far Cry 2, 4, 5, and 6, the character you're playing as basically doesn't matter at all. And in Far Cry 5 specifically, you're not even really playing as a character, you make your own rookie. So then what happened with Far Cry 6? Well, they attempted to make a character again, and I literally can't remember his fucking name, and no, I'm not gonna look it up because it kind of proves my point. And despite having third-person cutscenes and having a lot more dialogue again, like Far Cry 3, the story felt like it was more about these smaller rebel groups that you unite together to form Liberta. And of course these smaller groups were a reflection of the developer's ideology. Two of the groups in particular were pretty cringy, one of them being led by a lesbian couple but not actually, as one of them transitioned into a man, and the quest line around this group is literally settling his debts with the person who transitioned him. You can't argue that that's not woke. You are taking the player hostage and forcing them to engage with something they probably don't even believe in. And the other member of the couple is even worse. She's a psychotic bitch who thinks it's okay to kill people because they misgender your boyfriend. And I know at least one person's going to argue that I took context out of that scene because this blonde woman apparently ran some kind of academy for brainwashing people. Which again, just feels like pure projection on the developer's part, as we all know what ideology is being fed to people in American universities, at the very least. Not to say it can't go both ways, but this bitch is just straight up unlikable. She puts a gun to a horse's head. No, that's not a zebra, it's just painted to look like one and is obviously unstable to any normal person watching this shit, but because she's LGBT, we're supposed to let it slide. The other cringy group were the Zoomer Communists, and I'm not even saying Zoomer as an insult here, that was the entire point of their group, and they reunite with the original communist revolutionaries, which obviously the country of Yara was just supposed to be Cuba, so you can see where the parallels are there. And in a brief moment of lucidity, the communists from the 60s realized that their Zoomer comrades are more radical than they are, basically wanting to burn everything to the ground. But I don't think that's what the messaging was in the cutscenes, that's the weird fucking part. A huge criticism of Ubisoft games from both the left and the right is that they never commit to any kind of real political messaging in their games. They don't seem to follow an ideology left or right, trying to play down the center. A bunch of game journalists threw a hissy fit over Far Cry 5 for this very reason, because originally they thought it was going to be an anti-Christian game. So all the fedora-tipping atheists were getting a hard-on at the prospect of yet another piece of propaganda demonizing one specific religion because they hate their dads. And then it turns out, no, it was just about a crazy cult and there's plenty of good Christian dudes in Montana, which is much more true to real life. The problem is, with Far Cry 6, they kind of went in the opposite direction, but didn't commit all the way. I mean, it certainly is much more pro-leftist than previous Far Cry games, 
but it has this Ludo narrative dissonance problem where you're supposed to be the freedom fighters, yet you kill hundreds, if not thousands of people over the course of the game, many of them being women, by the way, which is something I pointed out in my original review. So is Ubisoft secretly based saying we should treat men and women the same in every scenario, including chopping their heads off with a machete? Somehow I don't think that's the message they were going for. Now this might be beating a dead horse, but obviously The Last of Us Part 2 is probably the most infamous example of being unable to escape propaganda in modern games. Despite the fact the apocalypse took place in 2013, which is a few years before the trans movement even started, one of the major characters in the game, Lev, is trans. Now, because I never actually played the game and only watched a series of cutscenes because I refused to give Sony any money for that shit, I actually don't even remember what kind of trans Lev is, and I don't fucking care. But the fact that we are led to believe that trans people would exist in a post-apocalyptic wasteland where people are struggling to even get food or shelter and people are still killing each other and zombies are infecting people, we have time to talk about gender, and I'm not interested in debating this with anyone until every single one of you has read the atrocities that John Money committed. So we have that, we have the fact that Abby is obviously a roided out monster, which I feel like would be a huge waste of resources in the apocalypse to give steroids to a woman instead of a man. And if any one of you thinks a woman can achieve this natty, you're a retard. And of course, there's all sorts of other weird red flags, like visiting a synagogue for no fucking reason. <laughs> and again, can't even get into it or I'll be demonetized, shadow banned, all that shit. But it is weird that we get a mini history lesson on Judaism in the middle of this zombie apocalypse story. And on top of that, a major story point is Ellie and Big Schnoz's lesbian relationship and how an Asian guy gets cucked and they're going to raise his baby. Man, this rabbit hole just goes deeper and deeper. There's a reason why pretty much everyone hated this game. As for the indie side of things, I can cut these guys some slack because on some level, I do believe that there's nothing wrong with making your creative vision as long as it's a unique IP that you came up with. But it is a shame when you have a game like A Hat in Time, which on the surface, you're just playing as a little girl in a collect-a-thon 3D platformer adventure, and it's a great game. I'd recommend it to anybody who's a fan of the genre. But of course, there is a trans flag in the game. And look, I've now had to cut two rants too edgy for YouTube about this specific issue. So I'll just try and put it as plainly as possible. At best, this is widely misplaced virtue signaling, which is completely worthless. It means nothing, but at least Twitter can be happy, right? And at worst, it's grooming, plain and simple. This is a game for children. And yes, it is mainly enjoyed by man children and likely a lot of trans women who want to be children or have relations with children. But it does not belong in a kid-friendly game, period. And then, of course, you have Celeste, where apparently the whole story is a metaphor for transition or something. And Signalis, which, although I think is an awesome game, my second favorite game of last year, at the end of the day, it's about space lesbians. Talk about kneecapping your psychological horror story, where, in the end, it's about lesbian love. This is what I'm trying to tell you guys. I could probably come up with, like, a million examples from the past five or six years, especially. But it just feels like it's impossible to escape people's ideology anymore. It's not that older games didn't have political undertones. Of course they did. A lot of games people love have huge political undertones, like Bioshock, right? It's just that the nature of the politics have become so cringe and quite literally gay. Now to get to the next major issue that is destroying escapism. Remakes in general have just become soulless cash grabs. They're impressive at face value, but real fans of the original will notice the many flaws beneath the surface. I already brought up Dead Space Remake at the beginning of the video, and even ignoring all the wokeness stuff, there's plenty of other minor flaws that game has which are obvious if you recently played the original. It's obvious to me that the developers at Motive are massive pussies because everything about the Necromorphs, whether it's just the looks 
or the sound effects, or the animations themselves are less scary than the original. And now I'm somebody who's not really scared by any action horror game. If you put a gun in my hands, a game instantly becomes way less scary. That being said, this is even less scary to the point of several moments in the game being goofy. Just because these developers don't understand that animation and sound design are extremely important to horror. If something sounds goofy or looks goofy, boom, immersion is destroyed. So to try to get back to my main point as I've been just rambling for likely over 30 minutes at this point, all of this stuff destroys my escapism. Whether it's the wokeness or the destroying of my childhood games and making shitty sequels with Tumblrina tier characters, it's hard for me to just get lost in a game anymore, man. And I think this is the reason why I had so much backlash to my Starfield is going to be a disappointment video. Because Bethesda games really do offer that unique immersion angle that most other games don't. Even if they do have some amount of subliminal messaging in them, and maybe this isn't the best example seeing as it's an Obsidian game, but I think it still counts. Fallout New Vegas obviously offered a bunch of different ideologies in that game. And unlike pretty much any other game, you could pick which ideology you sided with and take that faction to victory to win the Hoover Dam and win over Vegas, right? Now, if I remember correctly, Chris Avalone actually didn't want you to be able to play as the Legion, which kind of sucks. But from what I understand, Josh Sawyer knew that as the player, especially in an open world RPG, you should have the ability to play as the bad guys. And the Legion, unlike the Enclave in Fallout 3, actually did have some complexity to them. Not enough, and as many players know, a bunch of Legion quests were actually cut from the game and there's mods to restore them. But it was still way more complexity than we've seen from the vast majority of evil choices in games up until that point. And that's what made Fallout New Vegas so interesting, is that you really could make a compelling argument for any of the factions being the right choice for Vegas. Now, if you pick NCR, I'm going to call you a Redditor, but still, they were definitely the most established faction that had already restored some semblance of civilization to the wasteland. And look, many people have covered all the factions in New Vegas and made a bunch of videos on this, so I won't go on a huge tangent about it. But even with the actual Bethesda games, even though the writing is usually much more black and white and simplistic, even in the case of Skyrim, the Stormcloak versus Imperial argument is something I still read about to this day. And with Fallout 4, the decision to make the Brotherhood of Steel sort of a lesser evil in comparison to the Institute was actually a pretty interesting story choice. Now I think both the Institute and the Railroad were horribly written, to the point where I'm basically forced to side with the Brotherhood of Steel because fuck the Minutemen. But still, at least there was a little bit of complexity there. I guess at the end of the day, what I'm asking for is another fantasy game I can get lost in. It can be sci-fi too, obviously, as Fallout is. But I want to get lost in some other world's rules, and I want as little connections to reality as possible. That's the only way I'm still going to get immersed at this point. On the most recent stream, I played Kenshi for the first time, and from what I understand, that's kind of a make-your-own fun sort of game. There is no ultimate goal. But even there, just being dropped in a new universe and not knowing how things work and trying to survive is pretty interesting. It's just that these type of games aren't really popular anymore, at least not in the AAA scene. Nobody has copied off of Bethesda after all these years, despite the fact that their games are obviously very popular. It's just that nobody wants to put in the work to create an RPG like that. And before anyone says Breath of the Wild or Elden Ring, that is not the same thing. Neither of those worlds are very fleshed out on the RPG side of things. I don't think anyone plays Zelda for the story. And even if you're really big into Souls-like lore, it's still not the same as actually actively engaging with characters and quests in the world, and the RPG elements are definitely lacking in Souls-likes at this point. And to discount one more example, if you bring up Outer Worlds, which actually is probably the only close clone to what Bethesda games are like, that game fucking sucked, 
Obsidian completely dropped the ball, especially compared to their previous work on New Vegas, the factions had no complexity whatsoever, it was just as black and white as Fallout 3. And the entire world and characters and lore could pretty much just be summed up as capitalism bad. I guess to bring this to some kind of conclusion, it's sad that some of the most immersion I felt from a recent game I played was the new Spongebob game, The Cosmic Shake, the spiritual successor to Battle for Bikini Bottom. Now I love Battle for Bikini Bottom, it's one of my childhood cult classic games. This new game is definitely not as good. Instead of being an exploration-based collect-a-thon, it is a linear collect-a-thon where the actual collectible is borderline meaningless, which is obviously a downgrade, but there was a lot of love put into certain aspects. I think the cutscenes are very well animated. The fact that it's just SpongeBob means that there's no real politics in it, thank God. And at the end of the day, I really enjoy 3D platformers and I'll take what I can get. So hopefully more games in the future can be like Spongebob or be like Skyrim or Fallout or something. This video really had no direction. I just wanted to complain about the fact that I can't experience escapism anymore because developers don't want me to escape reality. We have to constantly have communist propaganda shoved down our throats until we either choose to end ourselves willingly or we join the glorious revolution, which means consuming products. Let's be real, there's not gonna be any fucking revolution from these people. They're being supported by every billion dollar corporation. That's not a revolution, but whatever, I'm tired of talking about politics. Hopefully Hogwarts Legacy doesn't have too much propaganda in it. Not that I even care about Harry Potter in the first place, but still, since I've chosen to play it, maybe I can escape into the world of Hogwarts. Whatever, see you next time, guys.